go ahead and uh, open the meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I realized I didn't call something up here that I need to see. Um, so um, my name is David Bloomberg um, and I'm joined by members Elizabeth Silver and Sarah Northrup and associate members Maureen Scanlon and Bob Riddle. Um, and um, so uh, we are going to, uh, well, first of all, I'm sorry, I'm a little discombobulated. Um, the uh, notice of this hearing was published on notice of this hearing. I don't have that information on the agenda. Uh, when, Carolyn, Jan do you know uh, when? December 30th and January 6th. Okay, thank you. Notice of this hearing was published December 30th and January 6th. Uh, we have two items on the agenda. Um, and um, before we get to either of those items, uh, we have an opportunity for public comment uh, for anyone who wanted to address the board with respect to matters that are not on the agenda. Um, so I will first ask if there is anyone here who uh, uh, who is joining us who would like to address the board uh, with respect to matters that are not the two matters that are on the agenda. And um, you can raise your hand. I uh, Carolyn, do you see if anyone is? No, I, there's no okay. one raising their hand. Okay. So seeing none, we'll move. It is after 5.30, so we can move to the first item on the agenda. Just generally speaking, I'll, I'll mention that um, having opened the meeting and the public hearing, uh, we will invite each applicant, starting with the 5.30 matter, to present an application. Um, and you can also share the screen to describe plans. Then we'll have questions from the board members to the applicant. And then after that, we will invite members of the public to comment by raising their hand in the bar at the bottom of the screen uh, or via phone by pressing star nine. Um, and um, after we've heard from members of the public and confirm that the board has no other questions for the applicant, the board may vote to close the hearing. Um, at that point, we cannot have any more input from the applicant or the public or the applicant's representatives. And then the board may or may not vote uh, to uh, render a decision on the application. Um, the uh, first matter on the agenda for today is um, the application for a special permit for more than one wall sign at 144 King Street by Chuck Sign Company, map ID 24D-161 Northampton. Um, and I'll ask if the applicant or the representative of the applicant is here and ready to give us a brief description of the request uh, for the special permit. Yep. Oh, excuse me, I should add that anyone who speaks, whether it's the applicant or a representative or members of the public, we ask that you first identify yourself for the record by name and address, just for the record that we're keeping of this hearing. Is that um, business address or personal address? Uh, either. I'll just um, do this then. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. I'm Eric Martins from Chuck Sign Company and our address is 658 Fuller Road, Chickabee, Mass. Okay, thank you. And you can go ahead just with a, we have the materials in front of us, but a brief uh, description of your application, please. And I will just say, if you wanted to share the screen at all, I may do co-host Eric, so you can okay. um, share the screen. If you have the, um, I'm not sure what documents you guys have on, on hand, um, but if it is the the uh, sketch that we, we gave you with, with all the signage all at once, yeah, in front of the building, yeah, it's going to be just um, <clears throat> the three um, signs. That's, that's not going to work. Well, one of, they're non-illuminated dimensional letters. Uh, total square footage is 25 square feet. And uh, they're basically, it's just going to go, uh, one's going to go above the door and then 
the other two are going to go above the windows. That's just kind of like advertising lettering, if you know what I mean. Okay. So the sign that's allowed as of right is the one up higher. Is that on an awning, or, or is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, that one is the uh, the backlit channel letter. Okay. And um, and the reason I think we're here is because the additional signage above the door in each window exceeds the one sign you're allowed as of right, and that's why you need a permit, special permit from the from our board. Um, do any board members have any questions for the applicant? No, I don't. Um, I'm. Um, I was looking at the the map. On uh, there's an aerial uh, with an arrow on it, and uh, so I'm a little confused about the location. It's um, uh, it's it's right next to Cumberland Farms. That's that's what I thought. I I thought the building was even taller than this. Is it now bright blue, or was it recently? It was previously bright blue. Yeah. Okay. Is that the enterprise rental? It, it, it was that. It was also Phillips glass for right. a while, I think, right, right, or yeah. automobile glass. Okay. Thank you. I know the signs will not be illuminated. Um, I'm trying to find the standard we apply to a, just to refresh our memory, to approve signage or uh, additional signs. Um, so um, it's uh, the standard um, is that if there's something you can approve additional signage. If there's something, um, uh, let me just stop this screen share. Sorry, it won't get in the way. Um, but I can also pull up the language if you'd like. But it um, is. Um, if the board must make a determination that um, the, the number of signs or the location or the building and its setback um, are um, in such a location that is um, makes it uh, difficult to see or that there's something about the architecture that um, but they're located where they're otherwise allowed, but there's something about the architecture of the building or the location of the building um, that additional signs or signs that are larger sized, in this case, it's additional signs, wouldn't detract from the character of the neighborhood and should be permitted in the public interest is basically the standard. And then the board specifies the precise sign size that's permitted um, and typically, you know, if the application um, identifies that size, but if there's some reason that the board uh, wanted to condition it to be smaller or in a different location, that is also an option. Right, I've got it now. So it's th section 350-7.2M, mm -hmm. one, two, and three. Okay, um, and thank you. And uh, I guess if there are no other board questions, I'll ask if there are any members of the public who, are, who would like to ask about um, this well, application I, or comment in? Maureen, or there, I think had I'm her sorry. hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Go ahead, Maureen. You're muted. The round sign will be illuminated. Yes, the round sign is illuminated. And that's the sign that would be already um, that's by within, right. within code. Yes. Within zoning code. Okay. How is that illuminated? Uh, the, the round sign that is uh, LED. From inside? Mm -hmm. So that's like backlit? Yes. Yep. Yep. And I assume that there were uh, already some, there's an understanding about how, uh, if those that will be lit during business hours or beyond business hours. Carolyn, is that part of what we should inquire about? Because we're only being asked to look at those 
three uh, the additional signage, right? Correct. Okay. So um, the sign, um, the sign lighting for um, hours is really um, is only regulated um, for those sort of um, dynamic display signs at this point. And since it's not part of your special permit request, it wouldn't be um, within the review, I would say, because you're just looking at adding those additional signs. Right. Uh, unless you want to make a connection that by granting the additional signage, the overall package, you can certainly look at it in that light as well. Um, uh, if um, there's a relationship to allowing more signage, but not but making sure that it's, you know, overall that it um, is only visible during business hours, I think could be appropriate, but you are just, the special permit is really just about those three additional signs. Yes, that's correct. Any other board questions? If not, then uh, I'll ask if there is anyone uh, from the public who is attending and would like to comment or ask about this application. And all such comments or questions should be directed to the board, not to the uh, applicant. Um, uh, uh, Carolyn, are we seeing anybody? I know, I don't see any. Um... Okay indication. So seeing none. Um, I move to close the public hearing. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor. I guess we have to do a roll call because of the virtual meeting. Yep. Yep. Um, Sarah Northrup. Yes. Elizabeth Silver. Yes. Uh, David Bloomberg. Yes. And now do we have a motion on the uh, request for a special permit? Yeah, I move that we approve the request for a special permit for 144 King Street for the signs as described in the application. Okay, second. Second. Okay, and uh, roll call vote, please. Uh, Sarah Docker. Aye. Elizabeth Silver. Yes. And David Bloomberg. Yes. So that takes care of that. Thank you. Let's have a, a, a couple more questions. Will, will there be a grace period for an appeal? Yes, so the process is that um, once the decision is issued to the clerk, you would get a digital copy okay. and that starts um, the 20 day appeal period. And then after the 20 days, you can pick up the um, certified decision from the city clerk and recorded that at the register of deeds and then oh, go yeah. back to the building department. Okay. All right. We'll take that into account. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it is now 545. So I think that was good timing. Um, nice hearing all your voices and good night, everyone. Oh, right. We're Bob, Bob Riddle is not going to attend for the next matter on the agenda. Um, Bob. And that matter is Thanks. um a request for a special permit by Jennifer Pollins for further encroachment into side setback than existing nonconformity at 32 Maple Street, Florence, map ID 23A-139. Um so I'll ask if the applicant or the uh, or her representative would like to um, yeah, Elizabeth, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yes, you had a yeah, sorry. Before we get started, I just wanted to put on the record for disclosure that in the past, um, I've had a financial tenant relationship with attorney Lesser, um, which ended a year ago. And uh, most recently, I, along with attorney uh, Alio, co-ran a candidate's campaign that ended in November. So those are in the past as well. Okay. Um, I guess I'll ask if if uh, if, if anybody uh, has any objection or concern about Elizabeth hearing and voting on this matter, given that disclosure. I have no concern. I'm ready to anyway. proceed if that's 
if you're ready okay. to hear me. Okay. I don't see anyone else raising their hand to, uh, I do see somebody. Uh, Attorney <clears throat> McLaughlin, I think you're muted. Yes, I mean, um, I would have to speak with my client. This is a late disclosure. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you right now. Um, I can try to get to my client through texting if you'd like. Uh, sure, if, if it's, if I don't want to create any pressure, but if it's something that you think you can answer in a minute or two, um, then why don't we just uh, uh, hold, hold up for, okay. for a few I'll, minutes. I'll, if you just, I'll be very quick. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No objection, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll proceed. I think I heard Attorney Lesser's voice to proceed with the presentation. Sure. My name is Tom Lesser from the law firm of Lesser, Newman, Alio, and Nasser in Northampton. I'm here tonight representing Jennifer Pollins, who's applied for a special permit pursuant to section 9.3A. 10 of the zoning of the Northampton zoning ordinance. Ms. Pollan's property is located at 32 Maple Street in Florence. It consists of two structures. And to help you better understand what's on the ground, I'm going to put up a site plan for you, hopefully, which shows those two structures. In the front labeled 32 is a single family dwelling, which is a non-conforming structure. It's non-conforming because it's nine feet from the property sideline. And the property sideline setback requirement is 15 feet. In the back, there's a structure labeled garage, and that's five feet from the property sideline. Between them are stoned pavers, which are the driveway, which we'll get to later. Now our plan is to connect the studio garage to the house by a breezeway. And with that breezeway connecting the two, it will become one single family dwelling. And we submitted copies of the breezeway plan with the application. But if any members of the board want to see the breezeway plan, I'm happy to put it up here. It's a covered breezeway with a wood floor and lattice work. Michael, could you take that down? We submitted our plan to connect the two structures with a breezeway to the zoning administrator. And we're told that a ZBA permit was required under 9.3A section 10. The reason was that connecting the studio garage to the house would make the new single family dwelling which would include both structures, more non-conforming with regard to the sideline setback. The combined structure would be five, would be five feet from the sideline rather than nine feet from the sideline. 
Now I'd call your attention to the words of 9.3. The first sentence of 9.3a states, legally pre-existing non-conforming structures, uses or lots may be changed, extended or altered. And that's exactly what we're applying to do here. There is a legally pre-existing non-conforming structure. That's the house closest to the street. It's non-conforming because it's too close to the side lot line. And our plan is to change and alter it by extending the existing house towards the backyard. Now we could be extending that non-conforming structure by new construction, but in this case, it's being extended by incorporating an existing structure. Now, as the building, the zoning administrator pointed out, we're not allowed to do that by right. But section 9.3A10, which he said we had to apply for, allows that alteration and extension, and in fact requires it, if the zoning board makes a finding that the change which will include new zoning violations, and then in parentheses, new setback encroachments is in parentheses, such as here, will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming single family structure. The key words, key words here are substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Not just detrimental, but substantially more detrimental. And substantially means a great amount or a significant amount. In other words, not just a little. So your job here tonight is to determine whether the further encroachment into the sideline setback from nine feet to five feet is significantly more detrimental to than what exists now. I'm going to begin by addressing that issue and suggesting the answer is no. That change will not affect the neighborhood at all, let alone in a substantially detrimental way. I begin by pointing out that the two structures to be joined, the house and studio garage presently exist and there will be no changes to their footprint and no changes to, their ex to the exteriors of either one. The only change will be the construction of a breezeway between them, joining them into one, which is allowed as of right, since it does, the breezeway does not encroach into the sideline setback. And second, I'd like to address the character of the neighborhood with regard to single family dwellings within the 15 foot sideline setback requirement. And in fact, three of the nearest five structures to Ms. Pollen's property are as close or even closer than Ms. Pollen's will be to her side lot line. And I'm going to put up an assessor's map now, which shows that. And the pollen property is highlighted in blue on Maple Street. And I call your attention first to the property highlighted in yellow on West Center Street. That property is an abutter. That property was and is owned 
by Mr. Giordano. And Mr. Giordano erected a second floor in his residence, a fairly dramatic change. And it occurred within 6.5 feet of his property line. Now I'm gonna show what he erected, picture of what he erected, so you can see it. He had a single family residence and he made it a two family residence to the left and behind. I'd say it was a pretty significant change. And in order to do that, Mr. Giordano had to apply for a finding because his property was only 6.5 feet from the property line, that his addition was not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And that finding was in fact made and he was allowed to construct that second floor. And going back to the assessor's map for a second, you'll note that his second floor was substantially closer to his neighbor than Ms. Pollan's garage is to any residence. The structure directly towards West Center Street is a shed opposite that garage. Attorney Lesser? Yes. Um, I have a question about that property. It Once that was changed, was the setback, the non-conforming setback uh, shorter than it had been, or did it remain the same? It remained the same. It remained the same. It just went up an extra story. But there had to be a finding that it was substantially, <clears throat> it wasn't substantially more detrimental, and that finding was made. Um, the next property I'd have you look at is Ms. Pound's butter at 105 Pine Street. And that's labeled 23A-140. And as you can see, that property touches the sideline. It's not five feet away, it's not 6.5 feet away, it's not 15 feet away as required. It touches the sideline and it's very close to the residence next to it. And it's very far from the Collins property. The third property I'd ask you to look at is the property on the corner of Maple and Pine Street. That's 23A-137. And that property actually goes over the sideline into the adjoining neighbor's property. So I show these three, pres three properties because the neighborhood is filled with buildings which are as close, but in, in two out of three of these cases, even closer to the sideline. So this is not gonna change the character of the building at all. And you're not changing the height or the footprint of either of the two existing buildings? Correct. They remain identical. The second thing to consider under the special permit bylaw is the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian traffic within the site and on adjacent streets. There is, it will not affect vehicular traffic on adjacent streets. And, and I'd like to go back to the site plan for a second. And it shows the driveway and it's a shared driveway with Ms. Pollen's neighbor, but it's also a deeded right of way. She has the absolute right to use it. And it goes into a paved area, which is pavers or I would call them cobblestones. And that's been shared since Ms. Pollen's purchased the property and many years before that is when it was deeded. And I'd say that it is in fact 
been the subject of serious discord between these two neighbors ever since she bought the property. And Ms. R Ms. Robinson has argued there's not sufficient parking on Ms. Pollan's property to allow this garage studio area to be used. But that's just not true. Ms. Pollins is required by the zoning ordinance to have three parking spaces. And she actually has room for at least, at least four vehicles. And I'm gonna show you some photographs now. And the first photograph shows the area, which is owned by Ms. Pollins, which is available for vehicles to be parked. It's a huge area. And the garage is indeed a garage and could be additional parking, but you can see that this area would allow at least four cars, if not more. There's a second photograph shows that from a different angle. This is from the back of the house. And you can see how many cars can be parked there. So parking's not an issue. Now I'd like to show you a few photographs which show how unobtrusive um, excuse me, just a second on that photograph. Can you just identify what that other structure is behind the car that we're seeing? Yes, that one. That's a barn. And whose property is That's that Mrs. on? That's Mrs. Robinson's property. Okay, thank you. you see photographs of that. And the structure to the back of um, where, where the marker is, is a non-dwelling unit, which is a shed owned by Giordano. Okay, thank actually you. actually a double bay garage, right? The double bay garage is the, the garage studio structure owned by Ms. Pollins that we're talking about. No, no, I mean, the Giordano sh structure oh. we see is actually a two-car garage. It's a garage, that's correct. No, no. We're just seeing a portion of it here. Yes. Um, but I'll show you some photographs which actually depict this barn area. This is looking at the Robinson property. The, on the left is the structure, the garage studio structure we're talking about. And on the right is the barn, which is owned by the Robin by Mrs. Robinson. And in front of the barn is her house. So you can see how far it is from the garage studio structure that we're talking about. And we have a second photograph, which is taken from the front of Miss Pollen's garage, that double bay garage you just saw, looking towards the street. And you can see the barn, and you can see a small sliver of the Robinson house. And it's clear that the barn basically blocks the view of the garage and the studio almost entirely. Mrs. Robinson from her residence can barely see that structure. It's obstructed by her barn. There's one more photograph, which is a view from Ms. Pollen's side yard and toward the Pine Street neighbors. And again, you can see there's no dwelling close to her that's taken from her sideline. The other considerations are whether there'd be a significant change in the relationship between the structure and open space. There'd be no change in the open space, since the structures will remain the same, the only change would be the breezeway. And fourth, <clears throat> would there be overcrowding or negative impacts on city resources? Again, no. 
Now I'll briefly address Attorney McLaughlin's arguments that he made in a written opposition. His first argument in Roman numeral two is that the section under which Ms. Pollins is applying, section 9.3A10, shouldn't be the law. His argument is this section of the ordinance is unfair. It creates in his words, and I quote, a bizarre situation, end quote, to landowners without a nonconformity. Well, whether it's fair or not, has nothing to do with whether or not Ms. Pollins complied with it. It's the law in Northampton. His next argument is that a single family home can't have two wings connected by a breezeway. Well, that's just wrong. Again, it may not be as common here, but on the Cape and Vineyard, there are thousands of homes with two wings connected by a breezeway. I personally have a summer home. We needed an extra bedroom. We couldn't connect it to the house. So we had a breeze, we have a breezeway and it has a bedroom wing to it. It's all a single family residence. They're one in the same. There's two wings, they're connected by a breezeway. And I think there are examples here in Northampton, which may have been shared with you. And the building inspector agrees that the garage studio can become part of the residence with a breezeway. But perhaps even more importantly, that's a building issue. It's not a zoning issue. And John tries to make it a zoning issue by including a definition of building. But 9.3A10, which is a section under which Ms. Pollins is applying, talks about structures, not buildings. And the structure that she's extending is her present house. And parenthetically, the definition of structure is far broader than the definition of a building. A structure is a combination of materials for permanent or temporary occupancy of use, such as a building, bridge trellis, tower, framework, retaining wall, tunnel, tent, solar panel, wind turbine, reviewing stand, platform more than one foot above grade, clay structure, pier, storage container, sign, fuel, pump, or the like. Clearly it includes a breezeway. And in closing, I'd emphasize that the standard for a finding, say this again, isn't just that the project will be detrimental to the neighborhood, but rather it be substantially more detrimental to a greater extent, a significant amount. And I'd suggest to you there's no way that you should find that this extension, the further encroachment from nine feet to five feet is substantially more detrimental. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And, and the reason you're saying nine feet to five feet is because by joining the main house with the garage and back, the main house has a nine foot, is set back nine feet. The garage is set back five feet. And it becomes, um, but, one, it becomes, and it one, becomes structure. one structure. And, and, now, and now it's a five foot. Right. Uh, but, but, in the, but, but in the exact same footprint that it always was in. Exact same footprint. It's With just no increase in height. No increase in height, no change to the exterior. It's not moving at all. It exists there present. And it's five the feet is, is further from the line than some of the other structures of the abutters that you pointed out. Yes, yeah, two of them. Two of them. Oh. And the other and, and the Giordano property is 6.5 feet. We're talking it's like a tiny, a tiny amount here. Right. Any other uh, first yeah. questions just from board members? 
Yes, I have a question. Um, Attorney Lesser, I, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but can you address the argument that was made by your opponent about the use that will be made of the garage and how that affects this hearing? It doesn't affect this hearing. It's going to be it's going to be joined as part of a residence and it'll be used as a residence. You know, it'll be used for residential purposes. Um, your opponent is suggesting that the board look beyond just the argument that you've made to what the intended use of the garage is going to be. And we'll hear from them, obviously, about that. But um, can you can you respond to that? Sure, it'll, it'll, it'll be it'll be used uh, as a as a space where people where people in the family will gather. It may be used as as a bedroom. Um, but it's going to be used in a purely residential way. It's certainly not going to be used as a B&B. It certainly cannot be used as a lodging house under your bylaws. Not, he suggests it's going to be used in an illegal way, and it's certainly not going to be used in an illegal way. And certainly the building inspector would make sure that it's not used in an illegal way. It'll be used, it'll be used as part of the residence. Do you think it's part of our um, jurisdiction and responsibility to inquire as to the use? I don't, but I'm happy to explain that, okay? That, it, that it's gonna be used in just as another part of the house. So you're just taking the breezeway and taking the main house and the garage and essentially expanding this into a larger single family house. Exactly, and we could do that by new construction and no one would be inquiring as to what we're using it for, but we're doing it by incorporating a structure that's already there, which will have much less impact than if we constructed a new building on the neighborhood. Question? Um, just, I guess, curiosity, I'm surprised that the breezeway as proposed only connects to the garage, which you can't access directly from the what would be the additional living portion of that so the breezeway really doesn't connect to the additional living space provided in the structure it only connects to the garage if i'm following your plans correctly that surprised me because i thought the intention was to create a connection between the living space living areas i would let my client address that Great, great. Can I? Hi. Hi. Um, a couple of things, just to make clear, we're calling it a garage, but it's actually not a garage. It's a legal studio right now. It has AC, it has heat, it has plumbing. Um, I bought it like that. Um, it's all legal and, and zoned, and it's it's used as, as home occupation already. We're using it as a studio. My kids are out there during the day. I, you know, during the pandemic, I've been using the space so it's not just a garage it's got a beautiful so, pine floor it's a it's a finished space that we're using as part of our household my desire is to be able to have it be a place where someone can sleep legally right but so, so even though they're garage space. doors sorry even right, though they're garage right. doors it's not those aren't garage bays so there are so it's it's two things so i've already talked to the building inspector there's there's a bunch of things that i will be responsible to do to bring it up to code to be able to have it um you know to have someone sleep there including putting more um insulation between the garage part there's a 20 by 20 garage with two bay doors and so it is the a garage, studio right? part yeah so but it's, it's all i'm trying to say is that the, a studio exists with ac with heat with electric and with plumbing already in it. And is the, so does, that makes is, sense and that matches your plan very well. It just doesn't, the breezeway doesn't bring you to that space. That was my so, question. Okay, so two more things. So the breezeway right now, two things to also say about the breezeway. Um, right now there's a fence that comes up to my porch. Mm -hmm. That fence will be moved so we'll actually get even more parking, which is great. Um, about five feet more parking will be able will be able to maneuver even more. Um, and the breezeway, we because of um, cost of lumber and everything right now, there's two 
there's two um, plans. One is just to go to the first door, which is the garage, and another is to go to the second door, which is the studio. So there's two options right now. I think the one that you're looking at is to the garage. Um, my, I was informed that the breezeway needs to connect the two buildings. Um, I would actually prefer it to go right to the studio door. It makes more sense. It's just around cost, so. Thank okay, you. thank you, thank you. Any other questions from board members? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that there's a concern about um, traffic um, increasing. Can you tell me about the, the number of bedrooms and residents um, in the single family home at this point? And is that projected to change? Or how, many, how many bedrooms are there? So how many people could live there? things like that. Right, so right now it's a four bedroom, two bathroom house. So I I could have roommates. Like, you know, like there's, right now it's myself and my two children, my dog and my two cats that live there. I do have guests. I run a big um, performance art studio in Northampton and people from all over the world come and, and visit. So it, I, I have a busy life and I have a beautiful house that I wanna be able to use um, for my life. We're very respectful neighbors um, and we're doing everything we can to respect the right of way. And yeah, I have two teenagers, so there's a lot of activity, but that's normal. There's a lot of activity in a lot of houses. We're not doing anything out of the ordinary. Let me address so the question to uh, attorney Lesser. Um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the abutter, uh, from what I read is aggrieved because one, there's a presumption that they're aggrieved because they're in a butter and also because the sound seems like the traffic is um, the major concern that's been, um, that's been expressed. There's been a huge dispute <clears throat> between these two neighbors for many years. I mean, right now there are speed bumps, my understanding is in the driveway. Nobody is rolling in and out of that driveway. By your bylaw, Ms. Pollins has to have three parking spaces. She's got probably five parking spaces. If she used her garage, she'd have seven parking spaces. So she more than meets the requirements for parking. And there's not any inordinate traffic from an objective standard going in and out. But she, the question is parking and nobody's rolling in and out with speed bumps. So we have said there was, a, there was a problem in which one of, or one once or twice people parked in the driveway and blocked the driveway. And that has not, has not happened since then. And, Ms. Pollins is very careful to make sure all her people who come to visit drive all the way through the driveway onto her property. So I understand that it's an issue for the neighbors. All I can say is objectively, it's not an issue. Isn't that a matter between two private parties as opposed to something that goes to whether something is more detrimental to the characteristics of the entire neighborhood? I believe that. I believe it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a neighbor dispute. If the neighbor has a problem, this is if the neighbor has a problem with noise, the neighbor calls the police. The neighbor has a problem with someone parking in her driveway. She, she gets a tow, she does whatever she wants to do. Um, but that doesn't have to do with the neighborhood as a whole. And that's what I tried to address when I showed the assessor's maps. And I tried to show that three of the five homes closest to Ms. Pollins have structures that are residential that are even closer to the sideline than hers will be. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? I have a question for Carolyn. Um, in granting this, were, were the zoning board members um, to approve th 
this request for the special permit, would this give new um, ability to the applicant to do things with their property, with the structure, with the front building that they normally would not have been able to do? Does it change anything in terms of their um, ability to make changes moving forward? Uh, you said the front building, you mean the existing the main structure? House. Yeah, yeah. Anything like, could they that now move it to five, could they bump it out another four feet? <laughs> Not that I imagine she would do that, but does it give her permission to, in, so, for example, increase the setback uh, or reduce the setback even further on the nine foot building? Yeah. So your, um, the permit request is for the plan as it's laid out to create an encroachment in the area that's shown. So your evaluation is, is the expansion um, of the principal residential use substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood? And if there were an increase uh, down the road, if for example, they wanted to do a bump out towards the driveway on the principal on the house now as it stands without this attachment. Um, that would trigger another permit. Okay. That, but but they could add on to any other part of the house if it were conforming as to setbacks on the other side of the house, at the rear of the house. They could go up. They could go to the side. So there's no limit to that. But that's not the result of this. Decision right. I'm making. saying anybody can do that to their home now. If that you was apply my for a question. permit. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you apply for a permit and you have a house now and you meet the setbacks, you're going to go get your building permit and that's it. And you can have as many bedrooms as you want. Um, there's um, no restriction to the number of bedrooms per house. Um, so, um, and also in the URB district, by right, you can have. Um, three units in, in, in a structure, if you meet the fire codes and all, all of those kinds of things. But, um, you know, so there's a whole panoply of things that are allowed within for anybody in the urban residential B district. I yep. do appreciate Maureen's question though. Um, and I think, you know, basically what you're asking is there then, does that extend then to the main house, whether that, that five foot setback then would extend to the main house by right. And what Carolyn is saying is no, that any change to the house on that side and that setback would have to be approached separately. Is that correct, Carolyn? Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Any other board questions before we go uh, to other, hear from other voices? Okay. Um, I, I don't know, Carolyn. I know. I know that Attorney McLaughlin is here, and and I'm and I, I'm sure prepared to address the board. I'm just curious. I'm thumbing through about how many people we have. I should point out that we lose staff support at 7 p.m. tonight. Actually, probably five of seven. Um, so I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, but the options would be to continue the hearing if we're still going then and feel the need, um, um, but let's just keep plugging along in the meantime. Um, so I guess I, I'm assuming Attorney McLaughlin that you would uh, like an opportunity to address the board. I would, Mr. Chairman. May I go? go right ahead. Sure, Thank please. You. Okay, um, a, a couple of things. Uh, um, did everybody get a chance to read my memorandum? Did, did that yes. get distributed? Thank you. All right. Um, well, first thing I want to point out is I don't see any breezeway exception in the ordinances. Um, uh, he talked about a single, uh, he's going to make this a single family. The def definition of family is a single family building, building. So they've got to make this a building if they want to call this a single family. And this, uh, the, the definition of a single family dwelling uses the term building. So this, to, to um, to turn these two buildings to one building requires them being connected with a building. Um, if you say that, you know, with some shingles and two by fours and lattice work, you can make 
your garage that's not conforming now part of your house so you can do whatever you want in your house or your shed that's not conforming you connect it with an with some overhead uh, sidewalk coverings boy you're going to have mess is what i'm telling you i mean and there is breezeways is not defined here i mean when i look up breezeways usually they and when i i you know grew up in a neighborhood that had houses with breezeways and they were they had walls they were they had foundations they had concrete they had windows they had doors this is nothing more than an overhead covering for a walkway nothing else i mean they're not making one building by having this, there's two buildings with a structure in between them. Now, I mean, I, I, I know it seems like everybody else is getting to talk to the building commissioner. I called and I didn't get a call back. So I think the city tends to help the applicants more than the neighbors in opposition. Because I would love to have talked to the building inspector. He didn't call me back. So that I don't know what the building inspector would say or not say about that. But I'm not surprised at that. So what I'm saying though is that there's no exception for breezeways. I mean, if um, when Brother Council had up the plan and he showed how some of the houses are close, did you see how many garages and barns are really close to the neighbors, not where the principal house was? Now, all that somebody would have to do is throw up a covered, you know, shingled, uh, un open sidewalk covering, and you've got one house. And if you have one house, you would somehow get all of the grandfathered rights from the old garage or barn into your house and you can do whatever you want. You don't have to obey the bylaws anymore. You only have to get a finding from this board, that's it. And that's not the concept of zoning bylaws or ordinances. That's not what this ordinance was meant to do. I mean, if somebody wants to make one home out of this, um, you can look at what your town, what this city says a, 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 a building that has two dwellings and it should look like. It's in my it's in my brief, it's in my memorandum. It's part of the regulations that came in either in 2020 or 2021. But it said, this is what a two family should look like. Um, there's even one right around the corner from this building on, on North Main Street. One of the photographs shown shows where somebody had a two family uh, with two masses to it, but in between are two garages with concrete floors, with walls, with windows, not some covering for a sidewalk. That's the biggest thing. I don't see how a covering for a sidewalk makes this one building. Uh, and, you know, if Brother Council has a, a case law or a statute or a, another ordinance from another city even that says there's a breezeway exception to your regulations, show it to me. It's not there. Um, so I see this as they would have to come here no matter what, because they are sticking this structure onto the back of the um, prior existing structure. They do have to come here, but they're not creating one building by doing this. And I think that's something that you're going to have to say yay or nay to, because otherwise, my point of including the, the, the reference to Section 10 was not that I think it's unfair or wrong, which I do, but that's aside from the point, it's there to show motivation. Because I think if you say that this is one building, she could come back in here with anything anything because if it's one building and she claims that she now has the grandfather rights that if the garage is one building with the 19th century building then she could come up back here and say i don't really need to obey the bylaws anymore you just have to say it's not going to be substantial more detrimental and then i can do whatever i want because that's essentially what the statute says or at least that's the way the the city has uh, construed that statute which could be dangerous. It would be especially dangerous if you say all you need are some shingles, and you know, and some uh, two by fours, and no more zoning rights. You can just everything will come to the to your board. And if you say it's not substantially more detrimental than the prior use, you can do it. That's that's the problem. I just don't see how this works. Look at the photographs of what the city says a structure with two dwellings in it should look like. It's nothing like this. The city could have said, oh, because there's a there's structures down on the on the street off North Main going down to there, there have been times where I've seen the city with it, I don't think it came to your board ever, where people have put, you know, kind of these kind of walkways in, but none of the neighbors ever fought it that I know of. And they and, and they'd called something 
um, you know, a, a one family when it's really a two two family with, you know, uh, a covered walkway between them. There's no covered walkway exception. You, it's the one family dwelling uses the word building in the definition. And this is not a building unless it has walls, unless it has structure. This is just not something that makes two into one. Uh, and I just don't see any way around that. And if it doesn't make two into one, then they could still do this so long as this board makes it clear that all that you're giving them permission for is to put a covered walkway between two different buildings. You could do that. You could say, go ahead and do that. But that means the use of the garage is whatever the use is as an accessory structure. And that does not include the sleeping residence. And um, so that's, you know, very crucial. Okay? Um, watch out because, you know, th there's a shed in my yard, you know, that's probably not close. Can I just put a covered walkway to it and then I can do whatever I want in my own house because I don't have to obey the bylaws anymore, the ordinances anymore. I just need your approval that it's not detrimental to my neighbors, so let me do it. That's what you're looking at here. It comes down to that. All right, okay. Now, the, the next issue is this finding. Um, Brother Council talked about substantial detriment. That's not the issue. The word substantial doesn't, there's no substantial detriment to be found here. Something doesn't have to be substantial detrimental to the neighborhood. That's not the test. The word substantial defines the word more. So what you're measuring is not if there's a substantial detriment to the neighborhood. Is it, is it substantially more detriment than what exists now? And what exists now, what, and, the, and the statute even tells you precisely how to measure that. Look at the detriment of the fact that the single family home, the old home, the, the 19th century home, is not 15 feet from, the, from my client's property. Not much detriment, uh, not really. I mean, what it doesn't really, you know, it's still far enough away. There's a driveway in between it. There's not a lot of detriment to that. And now if they take, undertake a different use inside that garage, like a use where other people could be coming in to sleep there. Other people could, if they call it one building, right? They could do whatever they want if they call it one building. If they call it one building, they could try to make it a second family home on one lot, which is allowable. They could do a lot if it's one building. But, and if they did, the, the traffic that my client has, and she's not just some pesky neighbor, she has a shared driveway and she never had problems with a prior neighbor for years. The problem was with this applicant. She said she doesn't do anything toward. Remember, there was a shutdown order on this case. Remember, in the summer, she said there's never four cars in the back. And we show pictures of four cars in the back without doing anything to the garage. So um, you, that, you know, you have to take it with a grain of salt, but the, the, the traffic that could come about if she uses this for anything other than a garage is substantially more detriment than the detriment that's there just because the building's too close. It doesn't have to be substantially detrimental, just substantially more than the detriment that exists now. That, you know, so make sure you get your test right. That's the English language. That's the way the words read. It's not substantially more detrimental, even though people say that, that's not the test at all. There's a detriment that exists now, and it's not much. But if they use this building for anything other than an accessory garage, there will be more detriment, and there will be more detriment to the neighborhood because of my client's shared driveway. And it doesn't say all the neighborhood, it says the neighborhood. And courts have found that abutters are clearly the biggest portion of the neighborhood. And the abutters don't like this. My client is stuck with this shared driveway. So that's why we're here. I mean, if we didn't have a shared driveway, I don't think I'd be here. I don't know if she would hire me for this, but that's a real problem. And it, and it never was a problem with prior, owner, with prior neighbors who owned this property beforehand. It's only a problem with this one. And, and if you allow them, they're already filled up there sometimes with four cars. If that is made into something as it's one building, as Brother Council says, then she could do a lot of things with that. If, if, if you ever do, you could give them, you could grant this application, you could say, you can put this structure in between these two separate buildings and we'll let you do that. <coughs> that garage is an accessory garage and nothing more. That would be, I, I don't know if I can come up with detriment to that from my client. 
if that's you know an easy way to resolve this, fine, okay. But if they say no, this is a a new building, and we can do in the future. We can come in here with an application because you just decided it's one building. We can come in here with all kinds of applications, and that would be a huge problem because then it would already be one building. And and also, the other argument that was in my memorandum that's not mentioned is that the the statute that gives these rights to make illegal uses when you come in for a finding talks about the those rights in your to the structure that existed when the laws changed we're talking the 40s probably or the 50s that's the front structure that's the front structure of the quote unquote new building not the back part you know and so i don't see how grandfather rights that may have pertained to the first structure would ever come to the back garage, even if they make it one building. That structure is different than the front structure. Uh, then we get to the test. I mean, the, the, the detriment. My client has uh, children, uh, grandchildren, <laughs> and, and we really are mostly concerned about the traffic. The, the, the applicant has a massive amount of space on the other side. If she wants to spend money, why doesn't she just get a curb cut from you or the, or the city. There used to be a curb cut on the other side. Come in that way and park over there. You know, I, I think she might, I don't know, maybe she's thinking she wants to cut that lot off at some point to make two lots out of this. She doesn't now have enough frontage to do that. I don't know how she's going to create more frontage, but she's really close. She's within a foot. Maybe you'll see something from that someday. But she's got plenty of space to park on the other side. If you have to give a finding for this, please give a finding with uh, a condition that she, if there's going to be anything more, anything at all more than using this as a not as an accessory garage, that any of that parking has to be on the other side of the building. There's plenty of space. She's got plenty of space to do that. And they say, oh, there's there's plenty of parking now. There's already four cars there. She said that there's never four cars there, and I showed you photographs of four cars there. It's already filled up there. So if you put in more use, it's going to be a mess. Uh, so, um, and also use, use totally matters. Even though this is a finding, the city of Northampton has decided to make the finding a, a special permit. Not all cities or towns do that, but you did. So that means all the elements of the special permit come in, including use. They can't undertake a use which is illegal inside of this building as part of the use. And you just say, all we're deciding is the structure. We're just going to let it up. No, because it's a special permit. It needs a super majority. And it's got to abide by all the provisions. And one of the provisions is that if you grant this, the use that's associated with it has to be in harmony with the rest of your ordinances. It has to be OK. And it isn't if they say this is one building and you've just decided it's one building and we can do whatever we want in that back building now because we have the grandfather rights from the front building. That's what you're gonna see. My, my point of arguing about number 10 is not that it was a, a, an unusual statute. It is an unusual statute. I do these all over. That's a very unusual statute. But it's the point is I'm worried about the motivation of this particular applicant. I mean, it would, is she willing to say that only family members are going to sleep there? No. I mean, I don't think we're going to see that. Um, it, it were guests or these paying guests or these guests who will be somehow, you know, related to a business. I mean, I don't know. But unless you find that there's some kind of breezeway exception, this is not one building. It's not one single family home, which uses the word building. And if you want a building, you better have walls. You better have... It's a real building, and this breezeway is not a real building at all. Um, that's, you know, I, I, I can take questions because uh, I know it's a lengthy memorandum. I'd love to talk with you about it. Hey, questions from the board? I think Attorney McLaughlin answered, I was going to ask about those other points in his memo that he just covered. So thank you. All right. Um, I don't know if my client um, would like to speak, but I see that she is here. 
Um, Kathy Robinson, would you like to speak yourself? <laughs> uh, no, John, I think that you said it succinctly. Thank you. Oh, okay, All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, are there any other people who are here who uh, would like to address the board? Carolyn, are you checking? I'm not so good at that. Uh, I would. There's one person who has their hand raised, David Hardy. Yeah. Okay. Am I just, unmuted? Yeah. You are unmuted. And you're just your name and address for the record. Uh, I, I live at Hardy. 12 West Center Street. My wife owns the two lots that abut the garage with the five foot setback. Um, we're opposed to this. We feel that, that, you know, it is, I guess we basically have privacy concerns. There are five four foot square windows that open onto our backyard from this building. Um, and, you know, we've had a pre existing conforming garage there for the 20 years we've lived there. And suddenly we're looking at a, you know, roughly 2000 square foot home <laughs> that's now going to be five feet from our property line. And, um, you know, that's a totally different experience. <clears throat> and, you know, we went through this a couple months ago when the buildings were separate and I really feel that this breezeway is just putting, you know, lipstick on a pig. Uh, it seems strange to me that you would find that the garage could become, you know, a conforming garage could become part of a non-conforming house. That's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Anyone else? Um... Would like to speak? I see. Well, actually, before we go back to Miss Pollins, are there? Are there? Uh, you, you'll certainly have an opportunity, but I want to make sure we get other people who haven't spoken yet. And if they, if there is anyone who wants to speak, Mr. Chair, may I add one more thing that uh, came up in Brother Council's uh, statements? Yes. Um, when you, when someone asked, "Does the footprint change?" He said, "No." That's basically admission that this you know, covered walkway is not even changing the footprint. Well, if you're trying to get a single family dwelling, which I'll read you the def definition of a single family dwelling is a detached building containing one dwelling unit, also referred to as a single family dwelling. Um, well, I don't know if he meant to, but it sounded like he was admitting, well, we're not really changing the footprint. You know, there's this building back there and there's the building in the front and we've got this covered walkway that's open to the air and that's how we're connecting these and making it one family dwelling but it's not one building and that's what you need okay thank you uh anyone else who would like to speak who hasn't spoken yet just so we make sure to try to get to everybody um don't think i'm seeing anyone um i, I do think we we will uh, a response from uh, the applicant's side, but I think Ms. Pollins had raised her hand. Um, yeah, but I, I think, I don't know if, if, if my attorney wants to say anything, I think, um, I think, I think it's all, I don't have anything else to say right now. Thank you. Attorney Lesser, did you have any comments? I I just like to say that the nine point three deals with structures. We're not talking about uh, buildings and a dwelling. The definition of a dwelling deals with structures, and this is going to become part of a single structure. And I gave you the definition of structures, and the breezeway is indeed a structure. You couldn't is build a breezeway without going to the building inspector and getting permission. And the building inspector said, this is fine. And John's raising a building issue. He's not raising a zoning issue. And 
A, 10 is, is clear. If the question is, you're extending a, a structure. We could do it by building a new structure. We could come to you and have built, say we're building a new structure in exactly where those buildings are. And we'd come to you for permission. Well, they exist. And there'll be far less upheaval if we simply combine the two of them, which the building inspector says we can do. And I'd suggest that it's not more detrimental to the neighborhood, even if you considered use, which I don't think is part of your prerogative, to have someone sleeping there at night rather than using it to have a studio where more people gather during the day. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Pollins. Sorry, oh, okay. I'm new to this. So okay. um, uh, I just wanted to address it. it, it I'm, I'm learning a lot from, from this process as a new home owner and um, I appreciate everything um, and I'm, I'm surprised and saddened by some of the the um, misrepresentations by um, you know Miss Robinson's attorney and by Mr. Hardy um, just just to say that there was problems with the previous um, owner of the building I have written documentation of that that I've shared with the building inspector um, so there it's been an ongoing issue around the shared driveway um, and I'm doing everything I can and I'm willing to do everything I can, including signs and um, communication to make sure that we have a harmonious um, neighborhood. Um, and I and I feel like there's solutions mm -hmm. and it's been it's it's been a um, shockingly difficult um, series of events and treatment towards me by Mrs. Robinson and by Mr. Hardy. Um, and I just wanted to share a few things. I have a six foot privacy fence ordered for the entire backyard so that there's more privacy. There is not five windows looking out onto the Giordano property. Um, so these these are exaggerations. And I just I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and, and I hear that there are issues and I'm totally willing to work with my neighbors on it. Um, and again, it's not just a garage, it's a studio that has plumbing, has AC, has heat, has a floor, and is in fact already being used as home occupation. So it's 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 not, we're not trying to do anything but be able to use my property as like in, in the most beneficial way to me with the most respect we have for our neighborhood. I might as well, uh, thank you. I might as well ask, um, I assume that uh, the suggestion of having a curb cut on the other side of the house and parking over on that side is is not something that's you would consider. I'm just asking on that. No, it doesn't have um, anything to do with the issue before you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, that's fair. I'm just, you don't I, have to I, answer. I'm just, I just asking. Um, I, I will I want, say that the Robinson household ha does have two parking pads on it already so she's not we're not dealing they have another parking pad where their grandchildren right. park so we're not actually in competition with the two family households right. in question okay. and and i had a question for carol and mish um uh, carolyn <laughs> are you able to address this this question about elsewhere in northampton whether um two uh I'll use careful terminology, two buildings joined by a breezeway that's not enclosed with walls are considered to be or have been approved as one, a single family dwelling? Sure. I mean, I can give you a few examples of, um, uh, there are situations sort of um, that have, where applicants want to connect to their garage because they don't want to have to go out into the elements um, between their house and the garage. And many times the building department denies those connections because it creates, it would then encompass the entire thing as being one um, unit and therefore would have to meet the 15 foot or whatever the side setback is in that district. And um, there's an example of being a uh, property that was being that was denied that um, on Federal Street in the last couple of years. But many times this happens because they don't have the path forward. Whereas in this scenario, there is a path forward because um, 
case law that was determined, you know, back in 2011, which was the impetus for the zoning change to allow um, for single and two-family homes, if there's an existing nonconformity, you can expand that upon that nonconformity, including coming closer. But if that path isn't available, the building department turns down applications for connecting with breezeways right. because that makes the whole thing. There are other examples where in people have avoided going to the planning board for permits by making two units into one whole building by connecting through a carport or a breezeway. So yes, it's happened many times sort of on both sides of the equation. Um, and the building area, which is defined in the zoning includes porches and overhangs. And so that building area um, also called building envelope is what is looked at for the entire um, structure once you're connecting those, it, and, it and is wrapped into one. And could that be why in this case, when a zoning permit application was submitted to the zoning administrator, the building inspector, he uh, presumably made a determination that this particular pathway is available to this applicant because of the nonconformity. Um, and so I, I, I think the building inspector is not here with us now, but is it fair to assume that that means that uh, he did not he, he did not have any problems with this uh, idea that the breezeway connecting the two would constitute one dwelling unit. And because one of the structures was nonconforming, the pathway exists to uh, to get to seek the special permit for a finding. That's correct. And I would just um, put a little bit more clarity on it that it's not just that one of the structures was nonconforming, but the principles residential structure right. was non-conforming. So right. this was the path available for this applicant, but in other situations, it's not available because right. there's or conformity it, all around. Right, to put it another way, if the principal structure on this locus was fully conforming in all respects, this pathway, this option would not actually be available to the applicant. Right. And it's just, it's, it's just what is in the ordinance that we're, we are, uh, obligated to try to apply and interpret. And that's right. in conjunction with or um, in alliance with chapter 48, section six, right? Right, Correct. right, Correct. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mr. Um, Chairman, get, can, I, can I get to something that Brother Council said to you about, he, he, he said that the, what the, the question you asked, he said wasn't relevant because of I don't know why he said it wasn't relevant that they had plenty of space to put a parking on the other side. It's perfectly relevant. You, you've got, and use is absolutely relevant. This isn't just permission to put up, um, you know, a structure in between two buildings. They're, they're going to use these. And this is right. a special permit. So of course you could say, don't you have space on the other side? If, and you don't have to limit yourself to the minimum yeah, maybe the minimums are good for people that don't have shared driveways. You know, if this, you can't just use the minimum when you have a shared driveway. This is an unusual, unusual stance that they're trying to, thing that they're trying to do here. They have plenty of other space. They could do another curb cut. It's perfectly relevant. Use is relevant and the detriment from the traffic is relevant. And if you can get rid of it by saying, put your parking on the other side, you have plenty of space. That's perfectly relevant to this inquiry. In fact, we say that's the only way to do it if you decide to do it. But as I said, the definition of, he said he's created one family. That's what he said. That's why he can do this. That's why they can do whatever they want once they do this. One family talks about a building, building, not structures. And if he's creating a one family. Yeah, no, we, I think we've heard, I, I, we understand that. But right. I, I'm, the, the real reason I'm interrupting is I think we're, and I apologize, is I think we're going to lose Carolyn. So right. I think the board has to make a decision. Um, uh, we, we have the option of continuing without her because this is being recorded, but we won't have the benefit of uh, her wisdom and input and guidance and so on. Um, so the other option is, is to continue the hearing uh, rather than uh, continue tonight without the benefit of staff support for the board. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how my fellow board members feel about that. Well, 
Um, I'm, but it's fine with me to continue with it recorded. The one thing I would ask of Carolyn is that there was a memo of support for this application that um, didn't come through, and I don't, I don't think it's on the city website. Perhaps it just came today. Um, and I wonder it came perhaps, late this afternoon. Yeah, so I had to post it. See that perhaps they could just read it into the record. Yeah, it's uh, it just says I am uh, addressed to the applicant. I'm your neighbor, forty dash. Well, we we could do this either way. It's it's one sentence, uh, Sarah, um, saying I'm I. Uh, uh, please know I support your endeavors to use your back building. Uh, and I can't quite make out the name, uh, Tur Mrs. Ms. Turner, maybe. Um, but that's all, that's what that says. And we also we should also point out that the DPW had no comments or concerns, uh, and that's been entered into the file. But but on this point of whether we're going to continue tonight, I think that's the immediate question. <laughs> um, or or do as a board we feel that uh, more comfortable continuing the hearing? Uh, there is one matter on on the twenty seventh in two weeks, if that works for all parties. Otherwise, we're pushing into February. Um, I believe this could uh, be continued to 545 uh, on January 27th after uh, conferring just about this procedural point earlier with Carolyn. Um, Elizabeth or, or, or Maureen, any, any thoughts on this question? I, I have full faith in our chair sure. being able to move forward. However, um, I'm going to take a different tack from, Cara, from uh, Sarah. And I think it's important to have our staff support here, um, who is most familiar with the state of the law and the state of the ordinances. So um, my, if we can do this in two weeks, which I hope would not be totally detrimental to, um, to the appellant, I, I, my vote would be to come back in a couple of weeks. I no doubt there's gonna be a substantial amount of um, conversation among the board. Um, and I, I think we can close the public hearing if we want to or not. Um, we have options in that way, but that would just be my vote. Um, first of all, you ought to clarify discussions of, uh, among board members in open meeting during the hearing, not yes. obviously we're all prohibited from any conversations yep. outside of the hearing. Um, I tend to agree with you, Maureen. Did you have any thoughts on continuing? So you're muted. Oh, you're, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> yeah, better that way than the other. Um, <laughs> I would prefer to have staff availability. Okay. So I'll ask Council uh, Attorney McLaughlin, Attorney Lesser, does um, first for your your schedules. Does uh, two weeks, the twenty seventh at five forty five, work for you first? That does, Mr. Chairman. We'll certainly, lesser. we'll certainly make it work. Okay. So um, just Carolyn, remind me, do we need a motion to continue? I yes. move to continue. To okay. a date and time, certain. To, so. to, to January 27th at 5.45 p.m. Um, I'm yes. sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Yes, I move we continue to January 27th at 5.45 p.m. Second. Uh, let's see. I guess we need a roll call even on that. Um, yeah. So, um, Sarah Northrup. Yes. Elizabeth Silver. Yes. And David Bloomberg. Yes. So and to we'll clarify, start. we're not closing the public hearing. Everything right. just Correct. remains open. I, okay. I think that's a good idea. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. so people will will continue the proceeding uh, in two weeks at five forty five. I do think, um, apart from that, we can continue without uh, Carolyn to deal with the minutes that we have, but that's separate. Okay. And then to and then we'll, and to adjourn. Then we'll need a motion to adjourn after the minutes. Um, we would do, we just I, want to do I, the minutes now, or um, okay? Ex except there were some cor corrections on on one, just some typos on one of the minutes. Maybe that's okay. going to take a little longer. Um, but uh, everyone else is welcome to stay. But we're just going to wrap up here with uh, minutes and uh, moving to adjourn. Um, but but. I wonder if we should do the minutes next time as well. One of them had several uncharacteristic typos. So that's all right. Well, well if you down. tell me the date, I mean, what I can do is just fix it for next time and then you don't okay. have to go through that. Might, that might be a good idea. Okay. Um, I think it was October 14th. Okay. Um, I'll go back through that. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Um, it's, 
And then in fact, it kind of the last page rolled on to some notes from, from minutes from a completely different hearing. Um, okay. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so just we'll take you, you could take another look at that one. Um, and then I'll put that on the agenda for the 27th as well. Yeah, you, you'll see it's they're they're quite obvious. Um, okay. Okay, so I guess just motion to adjourn then until the 27th, please. So moved. A second. And roll call, please, just on adjourning. Sarah Northrup? Yes. Elizabeth Silver? Yes. Uh, David Bloomberg? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you all. In a couple weeks. Good job.